Hi everyone, Daniela Kuye here from Shareplicity Talks, and I'm very excited today to be having a conversation with Tim Buckley. And Tim is the Director of Energy Finance Studies Australasia at IEFA. And uh, Tim has over 30 years experience in financial markets, specializing in equity valuations, including as a top rated analyst and co-founding and managing director of ARC S Investment Management. Interesting that you chose ARC. That's a very popular, popular brand at the moment, as you would know, Tim. Anyway, welcome, Tim. Thank you for joining me for a chat. And I thought we'd start by you just giving a bit of background or explain your role and what you are currently doing at IEFA and what role the firm has in, in the energy and finance space. Thanks, Danielle, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, IEFA is a, I'm very privileged to be able to work at IEFA. We, it is the, an independent energy finance climate think tank. So we work at the nexus of those three. In Australia, we normally say energy finance and technology because you can't mention the C word in our country. Uh, but it's about the nexus. Energy is probably the sector, the biggest sector in the world. It's a sector that has something the International Energy Agency estimates $2 trillion a year flows into the energy sector, whether it's in new capital, whether it's funding the fuel sources of LNG, coal, and so on. And so it's a huge, huge sector, and it is absolutely therefore reliant on global capital markets. And so IEFA was set up uh, eight years ago and we're, we've now got offices in 11 countries around the world. We've got 50 staff and we're primarily focused on the financial markets. And so we were designed to actually provide a bit of a bridge between the environmental movement and the financial markets. And I think it was a recognition from the environmental movement that they are phenomenally motivated. They're very altruistic. They're very passionate. But when they talk, they talk at cross section to the way someone in the financial markets talks. And so they effectively asked IEFA to provide a translation for them and then also advise them on how their strategies are positioned and what works in the financial markets and how they can have an impact. But we, having said that we advise financial uh, environmentalists, we actually spend probably 80% of our time working with financial institutions, with regulators, with governments and with corporates. And, uh, and then we do a fair bit of media work as well. So environmentalists maybe represent 10 or 20% of my time. It's a critical part of it, but it's about making sure that that passion, that energy, that enthusiasm, that altruism that's entirely absent in the financial markets is actually channeled to an effective way of engaging with financial institutions. And given our mutual background in the financial markets, my view is the financial markets are far more powerful than any politician or every politician in the world put together. Uh, at the end of the day, money talks. And when you move the financial markets, that can be for good or bad. But at the end of the day, it is a very rational, amoral beast, if you like. And uh, so if we can motivate the right financial uh, understanding of the climate risks, the financial risks associated with climate change, then that will unlock a huge amount of capital to solve the world's global problem. And so I am ultimately very, very bullish because 2021, we've seen the alignment of financial markets, corporates and governments around the world with the obvious exception of the federal Australian government. <laughs> um, so we have a global alignment. And so it's about a pivot point that we have already passed in my view. So now it's all about how do we accelerate the opportunities? How do we accelerate the trillions of dollars of capital that is going to flow? And how do you avoid the stranded assets in the meantime? Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that I've had a passion about for many years. And uh, I think that so much has happened um, in the last 12 months. I mean, you've really seen not only as I use the example of, of Tesla, my, my you know, favorite company, the single man who is actually trying to change the world single handedly. And, you know, I, in my opinion, he's already achieved what he set out to do, which is basically accelerating the race to electric vehicles with the incumbent ice manufacturers. 
But there really was like a pivot point last year when Biden, I think, won the election and you suddenly had an, an administration. I know that um, Obama, there was lots of hope. And obviously in um, uh, President Trump, you have somebody who is not predisposed towards carbon transitioning. But do you think this, the, the Biden administration coming to the party, um, the International Energy Agency, what they have done. We've seen a massive turning point in the last few months, Tim. And if there's always numbers floating about, about the size of money that needs to go into the transition to decarbonise globally. And they're probably a moving feast. I tried to quote them in my latest book because I think there's massive opportunities and risks when it comes to invest for investors. But do you have any comments first about the changes from Biden and B in terms of the amounts of money that really need to be shifted to change to get that energy transition we need? Yeah, I think President Biden is an absolute breath of fresh air. He's a man on a mission. I think even every uh, everyone who's ambitious on climate policy would say what he's done so far has been staggering. And so good on him. Uh, long may it last. But I'd also argue probably the pivot point was, in fact, as you said, 2020, in fact, September 2020. And that was when President Z came out with his net zero emissions pledge. Now, I reckon it was actually China, as always, playing politics, climate and politics and trade all go hand in hand. I think it was President Xi actually reading the tea leaves and saying, well, heads, we get Trump back and America isolates and America stagnates and America goes inward and China gets to take over the world alongside Europe and climate becomes the opportunity for them to take a global leadership role. And then if Biden gets in, America's going to be all in on climate. So either way, heads or tails, China had to get ahead of the curve. And so I'd actually argue it was China being very political, as they are. They're very long dated. They're very far forward thinkers. And so I'd say the September announcement by China, but then it was the beauty of having the Prime Minister Suga of Japan come out and commit to net zero by 2050, and then Korea, uh, President Moon Jae-in coming out two days later, committing to net zero. So all of a sudden, you've got Europe moving. Well, Europe's been moving now for two decades, but it's joined by China, Japan and Korea. And then the icing on the cake is President Biden. And President Biden, I mean, I read a very, very, or listened to a transcript for, of the um, uh, the chair of the Economic Council for President Biden, it was Brian Dees, who's ex-BlackRock, and uh, he made the comment that everything Biden does is about trade, China, and climate, and the three, you have to look at the three interconnectedly. Mm. But he also said it's about Biden's mission is to actually rebuild American supremacy mm. because mm. they realise they've actually, under Trump, gone backwards, and they've allowed China to be the world leader. So it's it's really a race to maintain America's place in the world, but it's a great race because I don't care whether China or America wins. At the end of the day, we want a race. We want a race to the solution and we need every country doing more than their fair share. And so it's great that America is all in two, four, six trillion dollars of capital from the American government will certainly underwrite a huge transformation in America, and that will drive technology innovation. I mean, you mentioned Tesla. The Americans are still brilliant at innovation, mm. and uh, China's brilliant in its own ways, but the more competition between China, Korea, Japan, okay, even, even Europe and America, that's great. So we're going to have unprecedented technology development. We're going to have unprecedented investment, and we're going to have scale that was unimaginable even two years ago. And so that will drive further deflation. So I am very bullish. I do think the financial markets are literally unlimited in their capital capacity. And so I mentioned a figure of $2 trillion a year. But if you think by 2050, that's 29 years. So we're talking about $58 trillion of capital will be spent in the energy markets in the next three decades. And so that's a huge amount of money. But the reality is the world's actually been spending that every year for the last decade or two anyway. So it's about reallocating capital rather than new capital. Now, maybe to some degree, there's a pull forward of capital as well, because renewable energy is very capital intensive. It's got a zero marginal cost of production once it's built. 
So you have a pull forward effect. And on top of that, you still have continued growth in the emerging markets. So I would say maybe talking $60 trillion by 2050 is probably understating it by a factor of two because you've got economic growth and a pull forward on top. So at the end of the day, we're talking unbelievably large numbers and that's the magnitude of the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. It's um, I think what's so interesting is when you, well, there's lots of interesting things you said and it's always trying to fit everything in a short time span, but It's the interconnectedness between, I think people don't realise that if you invest, then you have to be looking at what is happening in the energy space and the climate space. They're not all mutually exclusive. They're totally intertwined. And um, I think that um, that is sometimes where people get a little bit unstuck. They sort of put love to put everything in a little box and separate it, but that's not how it works at all. So that was the first point. The second point that I thought you made was really interesting. It's about deflation and talking about the driving of the costs down and down for renewable energy and the technological advances. And it is one of the biggest arguments for investors at the moment. Are we going into a reflation, inflationary 1970s style, or are we in a more potentially disinflationary cycle? And I think when you look at the renewable energy space, you, you're now talking about, um, I was listening to you talk about um, the, what's happened in the thermal coal market. So you're actually seeing the irony is, is when capital is deprived um, from the fossil fuel industry, you're actually getting um, price increases going on there, but it, ultimately that's going to make renewables and clean energy even more affordable, which drives a deflation in energy costs and that's something I want to move on to BlackRock but or or just the opportunities but maybe you could touch on what is going to happen in the fossil fuel markets as the transition goes on because a lot of people don't understand well if we're transitioning then obviously the oil price must must collapse but it's actually the inverse isn't it Tim with 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 fossil fuels Yeah, it's interesting. Every time the coal price goes up, the Minerals Council of Australia says, oh, look, there's proof Tim Buckley's wrong. And I just laugh because we don't actually forecast price. We forecast volume. Um, Exactly as you said, the higher the price goes, the faster the transition. The higher the coal price goes, the faster renewables become competitive. So uh, we do not forecast price. Price And in fact, what we've seen is the coal price in the last 12 months has actually doubled and we are now seeing a similar trend emerging in the US and I'd I'd flag it. Um, Our our gas and LNG analyst, Bruce Robinson, flagged it six months ago. He expected LNG, not not LNG, uh, Henry Hub gas prices in America would double. Now, they just hit $3.50 this week. So they're up 100% from their lows but his forecast is they're going to five or six. Now, that is because we've had a decade of this Ponzi scheme where US capital was happy to invest in Mm. fracking. And now the emperor is clearly naked and the capital returns are not there. The Ponzi scheme's exposed. And so now that the... um, Uh, Well, the US economy is back on track. We're not seeing the drill rig rate going Mm. back up anywhere near what you'd expect. It's still, I mean, it's doubled from its lows, but it's still down 50% on where it was two years ago. And that means you're going to have tighter supply of gas in the US market going forward, which means higher gas prices. Now, that then accelerates the deployment of wind, solar and batteries. And in fact, uh, I was looking at the US uh, grid queue, there's 204 gigawatts of battery proposals by investors in the transmission queue um, at the start of this year. There is 400 gigawatts of solar projects in the transmission queue. There's 200 gigawatts. Like these are numbers just by each one of them. I mean, the Australian market's 50 gigs by comparison <laughs> to capacity. And you go, investors are just queuing up left, right and centre to throw money at wind, solar and batteries. Now, OK, I'll acknowledge there's a 30% tax credit in there, but you know, I'm a bit off track. All I'm saying is there will there is literally a trillion dollars of capital queued up waiting to be deployed in wind, solar and batteries in America today. Um, and that's the official numbers. They're not mine. That's straight out of NREL, the Department of Energy in the US. Going back to deflation, I love talking to Dr. Martin Green. I mean, he's got to be anyone's energy hero. 
um, is just the founder of solar technology mm. development. And 40 years later, he's still just as passionate, still just as ambitious and, and confident, in fact, that the technology development in solar is actually accelerating. And he forecast uh, the Smart Energy Council that solar costs would halve in the next five years. He actually said three to five years. I'm giving him a little bit of extra space. We are, as you say, uh, seeing a increase in solar module prices right now because every commodity in the world is going up in 2021. So maybe this will be the first year in a decade solar module prices haven't gone down double digits, but the technology improvements are still coming through staggeringly fast. And in fact, uh, Dr. Martin Green talks about it accelerating, the rate of technology improvement in solar accelerating. So IEFA has long forecast double digit annual deflation in solar and deflation, to me, it's an obvious comment, but that means 10% reduction every year. So the only, your listeners probably need to think about mobile phones, the magnitude of the deflation in mobile phones that just disrupted the entire market. Mm, mm, mm. Well, we've seen solar prices drop 90% in a decade. They're going to drop at least another 50, 60, 70% in wow. the next decade. So when it is sunny, power prices, wholesale power prices will be virtually zero Mm, mm. all the time for eight or 10 hours every day for probably nine months of the year in Australia and in America and in Spain and in Chile and Mexico and in Brazil, anywhere where there's decent sun and in India. So that totally transforms the global market. So we, like I was talking to the Energy Security Board last week and the question they were saying is Australian wholesale power prices are now regularly negative. Yes, yes. No, that is a given. And so the duck curve that has long been talked about in California, that's dead. We've mm. actually gone beyond. We haven't gone down to net zero demand. We've gone negative mm. demand, mm. which means mm. negative prices. And that is a massive spur for batteries and for pumped hydro storage and for demand response management. So all of these changes, artificial intelligence, smart meters means that deflation becomes the systemic norm for energy markets globally. And uh, I think the real theme will be electrify everything mm, to mm. absolutely unlock massive mm. scale and massive mm. decarbonisation and massive deflation. Mm. I just find it all, I get really excited. I'm probably one of those strange people that goes, I can't wait till I have an off-grid house and I have my electric car and you have a smart meter and then you can maybe export some electricity to, you know, your friend's place, et cetera. But, you know, that's probably a little way off in Australia. So I guess you you touched on there um, a lot of points, but um, I just wanted to quote the former Bank of England governor, and he said, climate change is the investing op um, opportunity of the generation. And I think what you've just discussed lays that out to bear. I mean, there is so much potentially there. And um, in my latest book, I give investors quite a good idea of how you can invest uh, into that space in the US because there are more opportunities than there are here. We obviously have the mineral opportunities, but we don't really have the technology opportunities, um, unfortunately, at this stage. Um, but let's touch on two things. So there's, there's obviously the opportunities, but then there's the stranded assets. And um, there was a report that um, your colleague did recently on a very major ETF provider. And maybe, Tim, you can try and um, explain to people that when you invest in an ETF, you're basically scooping up all companies, good, bad, and indifferent. And in doing that, if you have an ESG focus or you want to invest to, to change the world, you just don't want to keep on investing in the same old fossil fuel assets, what happens if you invest in one of these major ETFs that doesn't index or through one of these major ETF companies? Yeah, it's a really critical um, problem and opportunity. Uh, every problem has an opportunity. But at the moment, the largest investors in the world are the index providers, the passive um, funds of State Street, BlackRock and mm. uh, Vanguard. And so we have a huge amount of capital, like $25 trillion of capital is managed on remote control with no oversight and the only determining factor is the um, well, low fees. And so Vanguard in particular prides itself on being the lowest fee cost provider in the world. And they're gaining huge market share, but they own literally six, seven, eight, nine percent of every country and every company in America. 
And BlackRock likewise has similar sort of power. States are each slightly smaller, but they're also gaining market share. So within 10 or 20 years, they are going to control 30, 40, 50% of the US market. And they're all on autopilot. Now, that is unsustainable. So one of the points we subtly put in our report was these are too big to fail. Now, I was at mm. Citigroup when mm. Citigroup was the biggest financial institution in the world, and I got fired from Citigroup for saying to our CFO that we were too big to fail <laughs> and we were unmanageable. He didn't like me saying that, and I said it rather aggressively over a big bottle of red wine one night, and he fired me. But um, that's history. It was the best move, my career move I've ever had. But at the end of the day, we were absolutely too big to fail, which means you are too big. And Vanguard and BlackRock are too big to be on autopilot because they are the two biggest financial institutions in the world. Now, the great news is Larry Fink has actually drunk mm. the Kool-Aid. Mm. And maybe two years ago, well, we know we, we spent three hours talking to him three years ago and he absolutely considered BlackRock amoral, it had no fiduciary duty, and he had no intention of thinking about climate risk. And then six months later, he made his famous letter, and a year mm. later, it changed everything. And now he totally accepts this is the biggest investment opportunity in BlackRock's history. They're his words, not mine. And so he's drunk in the Kool-Aid. He could work for IEFA these days. Whereas Tim Buckley, the CEO of Vanguard, has failed to drink the Kool-Aid, he does the greenwash and has totally failed to or abrogated his fiduciary duty to his investors. Now, that cannot stay the way, uh, stay the same. He's too big. He's too big to fail, which means he has to be regulated if he doesn't actually, if he, his board doesn't take responsibility. But I've gone off track. What is an index fund? Exactly as you said, you invest in everything. So you get all the dregs, you get all of the crap that, active managers don't buy, you're the passive and you buy everything. Mm -hmm. But Vanguard actually doesn't track the market. They sample the market. BlackRock tracks the market. It's a bizarre difference, which, yeah, most people, I, I, I would never it. heard that. Vanguard claims that's not correct, but you read any prospectus that they've got, and we've got a very, very astute financial analyst who pointed that difference out. They could choose to... Um, not have Exxon in their entire portfolio globally. If they if they watch the unearthed video from overnight of how Exxon manipulates American senators and Joe Biden and every other um, senior politician in America, at the end of the day, if you don't want to own Exxon, bad luck. If you're an index owner, if you invest in the market, which I mean, most people don't have the detailed knowledge that you have on financial markets, so they just buy the index. But that means they get all the dregs with it. So what we would argue is that Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street have a fiduciary duty to at least provide some risk management. And so that means if you know there's unpriced financial risk, if there's massive stranded asset risk mm. in these dinosaurs like Peabody or like Exxon or like Chevron or like Woodside or Santos, then you don't want to own them. So what you could do is very, very simply change your global index to the MSCI low carbon alternative index. Black, um, Vanguard could do that tomorrow without even telling their investors. BlackRock mm -hmm. would have to go to their investors and get a change of mandate. Vanguard is so transparent, um, so lacking in transparency, lacking mm -hmm. in governance, lacking in oversight, they could do it uh, Tim Buckley could do it tomorrow and uh, his investors would find out about it a year later when they read their annual report if they right. get one. Yeah, so, and, and I assume too we're going to see at some point in time um, increasing disparity between these companies that are going to be left with the stranded, the stranded assets. And for people that don't understand a stranded asset which has no future, future life, does it, Tim? You invested all this money and, you know, you're suddenly left with you know, a fixed asset or a big oil well that you can no longer drill um, because it becomes banned or the carbon price, if we ever get one of those, basically makes it prohibitive. Um, but Sorry, Daniel, I'll, I'll actually define it yeah, slightly do, do. differently. I'd actually say a stranded asset can have negative value. And that's, you particularly talked about oil and gas wells. The mm. cost of decommissioning an oil and gas well can be hundreds of millions of dollars. 
Now, that's fine if you're Woodside and you can just outsource that onto the Australian taxpayer. I'm sorry, that's exactly what Woodside does right now. And even Keith Pitt, our resources minister, is getting a little annoyed at Woodside for doing that. But if you can't abrogate your financial responsibility, if you actually have to clean up your mess, an end-of-life oil and gas or coal project can have negative value. And, in fact, I valued Mount Arthur as having a billion dollars positive value for the cash flows for the next 10 years, but a a billion-dollar liability attached to the cleanup costs. And so it actually has a zero value. Now, the question I have was, is it plus or minus 200 million? Mm. And that I don't know because I don't know how much the rehab cost is. But what I do know is BHP hasn't put the cash aside for that money. And BHP owns the Mount Arthur mine. It's the biggest coal mine in New South Wales, biggest mine in Australia, and it's approaching the end of life. So these mines, these oil and gas projects can have negative value And so it's not just you won't get a return on your investment, you'll actually end up, if you still own it and the government forces you to clean up, you could end up losing money dramatically. But stranded asset means you are not going to operate the asset over its expected useful life and get the returns you expected. And so, as you say, it could be a carbon price, but I think the deflation in wind and solar is now so extreme that you actually, uh, it's market forces that's doing it. It's not government. It's not the carbon price. The, we, it would be great if we had a carbon price, but the reality is stranded asset risk is a clear and present danger. And we saw about $5 billion of write downs earlier in 2021 by the coal fired power company owners across mm. Australia acknowledging mm. that stranded asset risk. Absolutely. Yes, it's, it's, it's not only the deflation, it's also the quality of the products. I always say to, um, I, you know, I'm a bit like a broken record with Tesla, but you go in a Tesla once and you, you will always then dream of when you can have that Tesla. And once they make, be able to make their electric cars or you see other electric vehicles move down the cost scale so that they are more price uh, competitive, I think it becomes a no brainer because the technology just so outweighs you know, I'm driving around in a little Lexus hybrid, which, you know, is old technology now, Tim. I mean, it was, whatever, 15 years ago, quite advanced, but now it's old. And uh, I think everybody, as you say, will start to smell, smell the Kool-Aid. So really, from an investor's perspective, there's two sides of the coin. There are the investing opportunities, which are absolutely massive, but they also need to keep an eye out for not getting caught out in, let's say, an AGL or an Origin or one of those companies. I sold those companies years and years ago. Um, Do you think that that this whole concept of having activist investors on the boards, like they've put three uh, new directors on the ExxonMobil board, and I think the same thing's kind of happened at BP or whatever, is this just all purely greenwashing? They're trying to, or they're just floundering. They just don't know where to go, these companies, because basically their business model will cease to exist and they just feel like, we're an oil company or we're a coal company, we can't be a green hydrogen company and we can't be a renewables company. Is that kind of how, is it that binary? So they fight to the bitter end? Yeah, and the trouble though, what we're seeing is that Exxon's power, even as it thrashes around in its dying state, is still phenomenal. Their ability to bribe government officials, their ability to um, railroad uh, regulatory changes, to garner like Exxon this week was bragging about how they they got a billion dollar tax cut out of Trump. Value to the shareholders was a billion dollars. And they were just bragging about how they can still manipulate even President Biden to this day. Now, okay, at some point we're going to call them out, but Exxon to me is a dinosaur. So your comment, I see Exxon absolutely on a path to extinction. You don't want them in your portfolio. You don't want Chevron. You don't want another dinosaur. You don't want a Peabody. You don't want a Woodside. Mm -hmm. Now, could Woodside survive? Absolutely. Could it change its spots? Not with the current board. Uh, Whitehaven? Whitehaven is really, really profitable right now. The coal price is record highs. They're minting money. But you know that the CEO and the board under Chairman Mark Vale are absolutely predicated on pissing every dollar of profit that they generate up against the wall building new coal mines. So Mm. you're making record profits, but if you're wasting all the money on stupid capital expenditure on stranded assets, then there's no point being profitable. It's not like they pay a dividend. 
Uh, they're too cyclical. They pay one occasionally, but they will go bankrupt. Um, there's yeah. no other. Yeah. But yeah. when you're 100% coal dominated and, in fact, 83% thermal coal dominated, mm -hmm. they like to pretend they're a coking coal company, but Greenwash is alive in the coal industry. They're, they're a thermal coal company. They're going bankrupt. Unless the CEO wakes up one day and says, I want to actually survive, I want to do the right thing, I want to actually live in a livable planet, and more importantly for my shareholders, I actually want to use the cash flow wisely. But what does a coal miner know about green hydrogen, as you said? Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Whereas BP, I, I love cheering for Bernard Looney. I think his appointment in February last year was unbelievably important for the world. And uh, by the way, I will, don't own a share in BP and I won't own a share in them because the reality is the chance of him succeeding is remote. And if he succeeds, the company will be half the size it is today because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, 99% of BP's assets are in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And so he has to downsize like buggery and he has to run like mad. And the reality is, I think the financial markets, and there's a good study on this to show that the only time you would buy a dying industry is when they've shifted more than half of their assets into the industry of the future. Right. And so I love, and I think you you talk about the Orsted, the, uh, the old Danish oil and gas company. Mm -hmm. Dong was what its name was. It changed to Orsted. It is now the world's biggest offshore wind company. It's also mm. one of the most successful companies, as you know, in the world, in the renewable space. But it took Goldman Sachs to come in, sack the board, sack the CEO, put in a new CEO, put in a new board and say, sell off all the old crap and mm. let's invest in an industry of the future and let's do it really quickly. And by the way, the shares have gone through the roof because they're ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. For Bernard Looney's, now I looked at Bernard Looney's CV to work out how did he have this um, uh, road to Damascus moment? And mm -hmm. I think it was he said he walked around, he was appointed CEO and then had a three month sabbatical. And he went around the world talking to people. And he, he said, There's one person, he hasn't named who she was, but someone got to him and explained that he had an existential threat for his business and he had to change if it was going to survive. And he accepted that and the board accepted it. That's what I find amazing. The board of BP, full of old white men, he couldn't ask for a worse board and they allowed him to do it. Now, he will die or break through and my money's on him failing because the board's still there. But the, what he did do is he sacked 120 of the 250 top managers within three months of starting. He had to do that because he had 200, well, 249 of the 250 people were mm. oil and gas executives. Yeah. You don't yeah. ask an oil and gas executive what the solution is if the solution is decarbonisation. You actually yeah. have to bring in people like from McKinsey, who's his mm. new CFO, a woman from McKinsey. So in other words, he brought in people who are able to think outside of the square, outside of the paradigm, and have the confidence to stand up against the incumbent thinking and it's the group think that's a real problem in these companies. So Exxon's full of group think. They're right. They've got the answer. It might have been the right answer 20 years ago. It's exactly the wrong answer today. Uh, but the trouble is until you actually get a new CEO and a new board, that company is on a trajectory to zero. So I would say very, well, I have said repeatedly, overtly, Exxon's on road to zero. BP will come out of this as a key global leader. And it is important for the world because BP controls $100, $120 billion of capital and they're trying like um, desperately to actually take as much of that capital and inject it into industries of the future. So they're trying. The board's got out of the way. They've given Bernard Looney the keys and they've given him the mandate to do it. He's the right man for the job. I absolutely categorically will endorse him. I wish him all the best because the world needs those sort of companies. We need BP, Total, Shell, Equinor, um, NE, NL. We need all of these um, companies to actually use their balance sheets and pivot as fast as they can. Mm. And we actually saw that this week. Um, the biggest oil refiner in India, Reliance Industries, mm. Mm. just an unbelievable announcement. I mean, they've mm. committed to net zero by 2035. They've mm. committed to spending $10 billion dollars in the next three years, building all of the industries of the future that, in, that India needs. And they're the richest man in Asia. 
absolutely all in on decarbonisation. Mm -hmm. And he's also runs one of the most successful companies in Asia in the last decade. His shares are up 350% in five years. He's doubled the market performance. He's built businesses from a standing start that have transformed India. And, uh, you know, good luck to him. He's it's, on it's our a, side. It's the complete opposite, isn't it, of Mr Adani? Anyway, we'll leave him. Well, no, no, I'll pick you up on that. As much as I've spent eight years fighting with Qatar Madani, and he probably hates me, but uh, he's made $25 billion from renewable energy investing in the last five years. He totally has drunk the Kool-Aid. There's nothing that inspires a billionaire more than $25 billion of profit. Mm -hmm. And so he totally understands the deflationary nature of renewables. The trouble is... He is a billionaire. He's the second most powerful man in India, and he knows he can actually have eat the cake and have it as well because he can make money out of the dying industry because he can manipulate the law and get compensation that other mortals like us can't get. So he's profiting on the way out, but he is the biggest investor in renewables in India. So he's totally drunk the Kool-Aid. There's no doubt he knows the future. He talked... Last year, he did a LinkedIn op-ed, and it shows that the India is open-minded. Australia and Australian politicians are absolutely closed-minded, and our corporates are, are shell-shocked and scared, which is dangerous for Australia, for our economy. And so your, your suggestion, invest in America, I, I tend to agree with you with that logic. Um, but India is really attuned to the deflation, the benefit that renewables mm -hmm. bring. They're really attuned to the energy security benefits that it brings. They're one of the biggest importers of fossil fuels in the world. So the idea of transferring from imported high emissions mm -hmm. fossil fuels to domestic renewable energy, Prime Minister Modi loves that. Reliance Industries loves it and Qatar Madani loves it. But Qatar Madani highlights that renewable energy, solar energy will be probably drop 99% in the next four decades. So he thinks I'm conservative on my deflationary right. forecast. Right. It's it's so interesting, though, because here we're worried about whether or not we have enough, um, you know, oil in the country. What have we got? Four days or however? It's the most ridiculously small amount. And to think if you electrif electrified everything, um, then obviously that risk just completely disappears overnight. We don't have to worry about whether an oil tanker is going to arrive or not arrive. And I don't even think we've, we've got one, one refinery left standing now, don't we, Tim? Two. 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 Oh, well. Yeah. So um, I guess the thing is, um, do the whole concept of ESG investing, do you think that's um, still too broad? It needs to be, it needs more parameters around it. And do you think people, if they do go and buy ESG related funds, whether they're trying to do the right thing, but there's still too much greenwashing, do we need more regulation in that sector? Yeah, expecting our politicians to do the right thing or be forward looking. Yeah, okay, maybe Matt Keane, but uh, he's an exception, or Lily D'Ambrosi. They're the exceptions to the rule. They're, most of them are just sheep followers. I probably should be a little blunter, but I won't. Um, so, no, we do not expect regulation to do it. But what I do expect is, I mean, maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, when, when my colleagues were saying, well, where do I put my money? I want to do the right thing, but I don't have the right knowledge. Well, go, go for Australian Ethical. Or go for a really good, true-to-label manager. Um, but these days, uh, I still think there's a huge amount of greenwash. I agree with your comment. But I think um, when Larry Fink drunk the Kool-Aid at the start of this year, mm. You listen to him talk now and he he's, he's a quant guy by background. And mm. so he's all about the first thing he said last year was, well, for me to solve this problem, I've got to have the right data. I've mm. got to have clear, comparable, transparent data on a timely basis. And it's got to be sector specific. So he was all in on the TCFD. And that means that you actually have task force of climate related disclosures. Uh, Mark Carney, again, yep. the of the financial sector. He really has done phenomenal things globally. TCFD is really critical and it allows you to then compare apples for apples. Mm -hmm. And now we need to go further, but when BlackRock says, oh, by the way, the TCFD has gone from voluntary to mandatory. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not mandatory because the SEC says it's mandatory. It's mandatory because BlackRock says it's mandatory. Yeah. 
Yeah. BlackRock is far more powerful than the SEC. Yeah. Uh, it's far more powerful than anyone. It's too big to fail. It should be regulated, but it won't be. So yeah. therefore, we've got to rely on leadership. And fortunately, Larry Fink has drunk the Kool-Aid. He is leading because he sees the massive fund flow that's going to come to BlackRock by doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. right. Finance, totally amoral, but what we know is self-interest is a massive motivator and Larry Fink is going to continue to grow BlackRock by being ahead of the curve on ESG. His quant portfolio management system is called Aladdin. It's all about feeding the Aladdin quant model into every portfolio manager's computer so that they have no choice but to rate every company on a completely standardised global scheme. And within 12 months, that's what BlackRock will be doing with Aladdin. And so I would expect very, very aggressive changes from BlackRock because they realise there is unpriced risk, stranded asset yes. risk, um, still very, very active in the market. And the best way they're going to do it is to screen out those stocks. Divestment's a dirty word in finance, so let's actually just screen it out and let the active managers do it. Um, no, divestments worked beautifully. It's really raised the amoral nature of finance and called it out for what it is. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's the threat of regulation. Maybe, maybe Larry Fink's seen that President Biden's going to force this change on Wall Street, so Wall Street better do it ahead of time. And that's why I'm pretty confident that Vanguard will move very quickly as well, because they don't want the regulators to have any input into them. They want to remain totally non-transparent, non-accountable, and left to just rape and pillage the financial markets without anyone oversighting. So they will they will do the right thing because that is what's called for right now. So I'm pretty confident ESG has now moved beyond greenwash. And over the next 12, 24 months, NGOs have got so much smarter about calling out greenwash mm -hmm. and they'll call out BlackRock greenwash. They'll call out Vanguard and then they'll go and campaign and they'll, they will build, they have built a very, very powerful environmental voice, a public interest voice. And at the end of the day, financial markets just don't want to be seen. They just want to be able to maximise their profits. So uh, yes, it's, it's, it's follow the money. That's always the way. And, um, you know, money can be used for good and it can be used for bad. And I'm with you. I'm sort of having been, you know, looking at this for many years now. I'm, you know, as positive as I have been for a very long time. I'm aware of time. So why don't we do just three yes, no questions. Um, carbon capture and storage, possible or not possible? Pure fig leaf. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. But, hey, just put it out there. Uh, green hydrogen. Electrify everything and green hydrogen will do the hard to abate sectors. Right. So it's, it's, it will play a role. So it's not a no, it will play a role. It will never be the way the hype in the market is right now. Um, yeah, so that's a longer answer than you asked. No, yeah. no, I realise that. But, you know, we, we, we uh, you know, I'm just aware of time. Um, Tesla, has Tesla changed the world or not? I am like you, Elon Musk, for all his sins, for all his idiosyncrasies, whatever the word is, for, he's a billionaire. Every billionaire is above the law. Every billionaire is self-righteous and hypocritical. He has totally changed the world. And, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. He has transformed the world, the thinking, and the Chinese have realised it. And mm. for every Tesla, there's five Chinese equivalents. So don't underestimate the power of China. They yeah. are unstoppable. Oh, I agree with you totally. Tim, I just want to say thank you so much. We could talk for hours and hours, literally. I think we will have to at some stage. But um, your wealth of knowledge, your enthusiasm, your passion, and hopefully people will have a listen because I really believe that it's not only the younger generation, but my generation, your generation, any generation, we can now invest for purpose and make money, which is really positive. We've moved beyond the paradigm of it's just making money for shareholders. But if we can divert our capital in a direction that has a positive outcome, then I say, you know, go hard. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Tim, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Daddy. My pleasure.